Hi, I'm Vicky Iverson. I'm a staff data engineer at Plexure, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about behavioral driven development in PySpark. So I'll talk a bit about why we might want to think about using BDD, and then I'll show how this actually works in practice. Before I get going, I just want to talk a little bit about Plexure. We're a mobile engagement company, and what that means is we work with other organizations like quick service restaurants to provide a really engaging customer experience through a mobile application using things like targeted offers and loyalty programs. So we're really gathering data across the whole of the customer lifecycle from when a customer looks at an offer in the app to when they actually go and spend money in store. And we use all this data that we're gathering to enrich the customer experience even further. So data is at the heart of everything we do at Plexure. But on to BDD. And I wanted to kick off with a quote, which is actually nearly 50 years old now, but it still resonates today. And you'll see it pop up on blogs and stuff about BDD all the time. And that's because it really does get to the heart of the problem that BDD is trying to solve, which is actually not about testing, but about getting people together to define some really clear, solid requirements. So I think you'll all know, trying to build software without a clear view of the what and the why rarely ends well. And if we think about data engineering, where our software is a data pipeline that produces a data artifact, if we don't have a really clear idea of the desired outcomes for that data artifact, artifact at the outset, then we could end up building something that is at best unhelpful and at worst misleading. So what's the problem? Why is this actually so difficult? And the thing is, we've got lots of different people in our agile teams these days, all trying to play this team sport of building software. So a lot of people like product owners and business analysts who are representing the business and the customer. We'll have engineers who actually build the software. We might have dedicated test engineers. In the data world, we might have a dedicated domain data expert. And all these different people have slightly different vocabularies, basically talk different languages, see the world in a different way. So there's a lot of scope here for communication to go awry. And the way requirements generally come into a team is a product owner or a business analyst will formulate those requirements in the form of a user story. This will then get picked up by an engineer who will work on it and develop the software. The problem with this is that these user stories are written using um, natural language, which is inherently ambiguous. And just to give a really silly example of this, I could tell my partner that I'm going to be home late from work today. And then I would then stay at work late and I might get a call from him at about 11 p.m. asking where I am, kind of a bit worried. And I'd be confused, of course, because I would said I was going to be home late. Then it turns out he just thought I was going to be home a couple of hours late, whereas I meant all evening. And this is just an example of how one word late can have multiple meanings depending on how you interpreted it at the time. So it's very ambiguous. And if we think about this in a work context, one of the things we report on at Plexure is the number of active users we have. Well, what is an active user? Is it someone who's just opened the app? Is it someone who's looked at an offer? Or is it someone who's actually gone and spent money in the store? And all of these seem like legitimate interpretations of this requirement, but our product owner could have one idea of what that requirement means and our engineer could have another, and we could end up building the wrong thing. Which leads me to my final point down here, which is that it's quite difficult to verify the correctness of these data artifacts we're building. So we could try and close this feedback loop. So our engineers could have built this report that contains this active users metric. They could pass this back to the product owner and just get their feedback. Is this what you meant? The problem is we're talking about big data artifacts and often aggregated data sets where all the little edge cases and odd things could just get swallowed up. And it's hard for the product owner to do anything other than just say, yeah, it looks about right at that point. So it's very difficult to just look at these data artifacts and be able to tell what's going on. So what can we do about this? How do we bridge this communication gap? How do we start building this shared common understanding of requirements? And what BDD says we should do is define really specific concrete examples as to how our application should behave. And this makes a lot of sense because what we're talking about is fundamentally a communication problem. And we as humans use examples to improve our communication all the time. For example, if we're trying to teach something, we'll use examples to illustrate that concept and help bring it to life a bit more. So that's what BDD says we should do. And on that note, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna work through an example of a user story and show how we can apply BDD to that in practice. So here's our simple user story. It's not dissimilar to something we have actually worked on at Plexure, it's just quite simplified. But this is basically about doing some basic reporting on our like the loyalty part of the Plexure product. 
So for context, a loyalty program is something that a customer can sign up for. And once they're signed up, as they go into store and they're buying things, they'll earn loyalty points. And once they've amassed a certain number of loyalty points, they'll be able to spend those points and get something for free. For example, if we think if you really like cheeseburgers, maybe once you've bought 10 cheeseburgers, you'll have amassed enough points to get a free cheeseburger, which is great. So this is just about doing some basic reporting about how many points have been earned and spent at each store across the region. So really nice and simple. Um, hopefully not too much ambiguity in here, but still worth doing some BDD on. So where would we start? So BDD, as I say, says we should write some examples as to how this should behave. And what do these look like? So in data, our software, as I say, data pipelines, they're really just black box applications that take some rows of data as input and produce some rows of data as output. So our examples can take the following sort of form. So given some input data, when we do the thing, then we produce this output data. And once we've got our examples written in this format, it's where BDD gets really exciting and we can directly take these and turn them into tests which run against our data using Gherkin. So Gherkin is a language we can use to write these tests and they will get translated into test assertions which actually run against our code, which is very cool. It's not magic, we do still have to write Python, and I'll show you how that works on the next slide. But I just want to stop and look at this for a bit and appreciate how cool this is, because we've now got an actual test that everyone in the team can read, not just the engineers. And not only that, everyone can write these. So the way we kind of work in our team is the engineers will take the initial requirement and they'll start building up these test cases, these test scenarios, and they will then go back to the product owner or business analysts and kind of get their feedback, get their input. Is this what you meant? This is our interpretation of the problem. And already at that point, we're much more collaborative than we have been before. We're collaborating on these scenarios and we're getting early feedback. And you can see this is something that's much easier to verify than a really big data artifact like I talked about earlier. And then anyone can then add more scenarios or edit these scenarios. We've now got something we can collaborate on because the basic framework is in place. So it's so it's really, really cool and a bit of a game changer for that collaboration and that free flow and communication. So I'll just flip over to the next slide to talk a bit about how we actually implement this under the hood, because as I said, it's not magic. Um, we do still have to write Python. And every programming language will have a way of translating Gherkin into actual test assertions. And in Python, we've got a couple of options. One is what we've used, which is PyTest BDD, but there's another big popular option called Behave, which is a bit more mature. And if you are interested in doing some BDD with Python yourself, I would encourage you to look and see which works best for you. We went for PyTest BDD because it integrates with our existing PyTest suite. So we just have to run PyTest test once and it'll run all our existing tests plus the BDD test, which is pretty cool. And also I really like the functional nature where it makes heavy use of PyTest fixtures and it's really nice. I'll talk a bit more about that in just a second. Um, so I just wanna yeah, dive into what this looks like. I'll flick back to the previous slide for a bit just to remember what this one looks like. We've got our Gherkin statement, which consists of three statements really, a given, a when, and a then. And then if we, these are called steps. So we flick back here, we, implement step definitions. So the Python code that sits behind each of those steps is called a step definition. And we can, we can see here that we've got three functions that correspond to these three, three, these three steps that we saw on the previous slide. And we can see we've annotated them with given when and then, as with many things in Python, it's all sort of works through annotations. So if we just dive into the given step, uh, which is the top one there, we can see got this annotation given, and then we've got the English language definition in that annotation, the following transactions, new line, and then this variable table. So we just flick back again, you can see it matches the following transactions, and then this big string table. So what our function then does is it takes this table as an input. Um, so PyTest BDD turns that into a variable that we can input into our function. And then we pass that and turn that into a data frame. Um, I haven't included that function here, it's a bit long, but if you are interested in seeing how that's implemented, um, I do have a working example, well, this whole thing that I'm showing here 
as a working example in the GitHub repo. I've just got the link on the side there. You're more than welcome to go and have a look and see how it works in the wider context. Uh, the other thing to talk a bit about here is how the state is passed between all the functions. And this is done using PyTest fixtures, which is pretty cool. So looking back at the given annotation, you can see there's something, the target fixture, I'm saying the target fixture should be input transactions. And what this then does, if we go down to the when step, you'll see that it expects something coming into the function called input transactions. And this actually is the output of the previous step. And we've linked that together by saying that target fixture should be input transactions. And as I say, this all works using PyTest fixtures. And again, in the when step, we're saying the target fixture should be result. And then we can see in the final then step uh, that expects something called result. And this is how the state is being passed around. So it's all pretty cool. As I say, there's a full working example of this at the GitHub repo that I've linked. Uh, please go and have a look and have a play around. I might be adding more stuff in there in the future. At the moment, it's just this one example, so it's quite empty, but it at least can give you a flavor of how a example can work end to end. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, I'm Vicky Evesen, Staff Data Engineer at Plexure, and thank you very much for listening.